Hello, Canucks fans, and welcome back to another episode of Canucks Conversation. Phil Kessel is in Vancouver. Well, he's in Abbotsford, but he's kind of in Vancouver. Do you think he's making the drive every year? Is he at the Best Western in uh, Abbotsford? He's probably staying out in a hotel, I'd imagine, especially because the comparison I think of is when sometimes a prospect or young player, when they're not sure that they're that they've made the NHL team yet, they're staying out in hotels, and Kessel hasn't even signed a contract yet, so. I'm sure they found a hotel for him wherever it's most convenient. I've heard a story. I don't remember the player, but I heard a story of a player who just thought he was a lock for the roster and he like bought property and then he got sent down to the farm team. I don't remember who it was though. So I remember I did uh, an interview with Jack Stanika. Oh, here we go. During the, <laughs> and he was talking about when he was with the Bruins during the COVID year. Yeah. So oh, he yeah, makes tax, yeah, yeah, yeah. They tell him, go get a place to stay, to actually rent. We're not putting you in the hotel anymore. So he finds a place in Boston to rent. Then he gets sent down to Abbotsford. Or, sorry, not to Abbotsford, to the AHL. That'd be a drive. In, in Providence. Yeah. And the problem was that year, AHL salaries were a, a small fraction of what they usually are. Oh, that's right. So his AHL salary yes. was like 28000 yes. something along those lines. I can't remember the exact number. But he still had a lease in first place in Boston. So he he was actually in the negative. Like his salary wouldn't cover his rent Jeez. in Boston. And he had savings and it wasn't like a Yeah, not anymore. He doesn't. But Free Jack, baby. He um he had a laugh about it. He did have a laugh about it. Okay, well, I want to continue. Uh, because we're gonna talk a lot about Phil Kessel. I I, I gotta try to remember. There was a player, I think it was a Canuck. I know this story. I just got I got to dig in the old memory bank for it. But while I do that, let me tell you that Canucks conversation is brought to you by the 2023 Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is Toyota's brand new all-electric SUV that is designed to go the distance for you and your family. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech, but it still has that trusty SUV feel you know and love. And even though it's electric, it's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain. Whether it's rain, snow, mud, or your friend's questionable post-game recaps, the BZ4X will get you through it all. And of course, we are coming to you from the iconic Wall Center in downtown Vancouver. Looking for your next meeting space? Contact the Wall Center for all your event needs at sales at wallcenter.com. All right, so I got complaints about this. <clears throat> Faber and I, when we used to do the show, Harmon, you, you used to do this with us. We used to start the show with 10 minutes of just non-hockey talk, right? And when we did that, people loved it. But then there was also the people, where's the puck? Get to the puck talk. <laughs> Start talking puck. Where's my puck talk? And we always get to it eventually. But I feel like since we've gone five days a week and since we've, you know, we've got all these ads and all this other stuff, we never do the 10 minutes of BS. And usually these are conversations that you and I now have before the show goes to air. And one that happened right before we went to air that you didn't know an answer to was fencing. I brought up fencing. You never did fencing in high school. I did fencing. I didn't even know exactly what it was. I'd obviously heard of it, but no real definitive idea what it was until you explained it. So for people that don't know, fencing is like an Olympic sport where you have a, what's that thing called? Grady, do you know the name of it? The sword? It's like an upe or something. I do not. All right. No. Well, anyways, I might be Just the only the sword. I might be the only fencing, uh, fencing savant in the room right now. But we had this guy come in in like grade 10 PE. So three years ago, and <laughs> he came in and we all got to wear the gear and got to fence our classmates. Like you got you you got to like sword fight with your classmates. It was it was the most fun I'd ever had. Guy kind of lost me when he was like, believe it or not, jumping and doing a spin like you see in Star Wars isn't an effective I because I tried to do that. And then he stopped the lesson and then explained to the class that that wasn't a good method. I digress. I got my point. All right. Anyways, uh, Travis Wall is Wyatt aren't coming to the watch party. I do think he is. I think I told him that he has to. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. I have to talk to Wyatt about that. But I think I think Wyatt's coming. It'll be me, you, me, Wyatt, the whole gang's Karis Price. Grady's going to be there. Everybody's going to be there. It's going to be a real good time. I think Lachlan's going to be there. We're going to have a lot of people there. Going to be a lot of fun. Gonna You're be gonna a good assign, time. assign Wyatt to watch party duties. That's right. Yeah, Wyatt, you have to host the event. Uh, February 22nd, for those that haven't heard, nationgear.ca is where you go to get your tickets. Uh, you got to check it out. It's uh, it's going to be a fun time. Going to be a good time. Uh, it's Jacoby said, we didn't get fencing in high school, but we did get mixed martial arts. I remember doing a week worth of kickboxing with a guy that fought in UFC 9. 
That's awesome. Wow. That's so sweet. What was the coolest thing you ever did in high school PE? Floor hockey was always always fun yeah i mean i yeah i i just love the sports especially like soccer where i could just shred everybody oh yeah you played like high level soccer yeah right? like it'd huh. be it i'd be like give me the worst team possible i will still carry this team to winning high school pe so guy was a ringer out there <laughs> so faber and i both played baseball faber played at a really high level like almost almost went to college i think he had a scholar i'm not gonna tell that story but he had a scholarship to go play college ball um he was he was really good and we had the media day at Napoli Stadium in 2020 and they were getting batting practice and favors hitting them all to the warning track and um that was our thing was we Slugger. always said our Patreon content was always going to be okay we're going to do a home run derby or we're going to do this baseball thing because I pitched so I was like okay I'll pitch Chris can hit but I was like uh you know if he gets a hold of one and it's a straight comebacker you know not what, a good idea you know it's a fun sport to play tell me curling Oh, I never curled. Yeah, me neither. Never. Huh. It's a mental grind, too. You got to be so precise with how you... I don't even know. How heavy are the rocks? Are they called rocks? What are they called? Stones, yeah, right? Rock, stone. Well, how heavy are they? Do you know? You could curl them. I don't know. Exactly. You do some huh. hammer curls with them. Like 20 pounds, I'd say? I guess I've I never done it. I'm heavy, just. But... I'm literally just guessing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just throwing up guessing. Okay. All right. Where's the puck talk? I can hear. I can hear you, folks. I can hear the Facebook uh live viewers everybody watching this show i can hear i can hear you i can hear you saying where's my puck talk why aren't you talking hockey yet and we're gonna talk hockey because big news harm phil kessel is in vancouver reports i'm calling them reports came out late yesterday afternoon of phil kessel being at yvr baggage claim with his golden knights bag and then we saw a photo and it was random twitter users throwing it out there and uh i texted it to our guy frank saravalli who's going to be on the show later uh we pre-recorded with him so he'll be at the end of the show but uh phil kessel is in vancouver and then alvin puts out a statement that phil kessel is going to be working out in abbotsford this week we now know if those workouts go well he will be signing a contract with the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah, it's funny. I had somebody at me on uh, on Twitter. I think the I can't remember the person's name who first spotted Kessel there. Yeah, and they just added me. They're like spotted Kessel with uh, <laughs> with hockey bags, and I was debating it for a good five minutes. Should I send the text to somebody in Vancouver's front office? <laughs> Should I? But then I'm like, I, I was like, whatever. Rick's probably gonna beat me anyway. So I just left it, and sure enough, um, like Within 15 minutes, minutes later, yeah, it uh, it came through. But I love that Canucks Twitter had the scoop, and they oh. actually had the photo to back it up. Yeah, too. yeah. like it was not just word of mouth. Yeah, and and you just know that the Canucks weren't gonna announce weren't they were gonna announce to anything. Announce that, yeah, that they quickly. were gonna. Why would you announce that? Like, right. I understand why they did, and you know what? Kudos to them for getting out in front of it once it came out. Like they they were quick. I I was expecting to see something today about like. Phil's doing a workout. I was expecting to see that at like, or maybe they wait till Friday afternoon to announce it that he's been working out in Vancouver. But no, kudos to them, like immediately. And you know what? The PR staff answered questions I had. Like I was asking if this was an ATO, all that stuff, if it was a PTO, what was coming. And they answered all my questions. And hey, like they were quick. Kudos to the Canucks on this one. It was great. And like Canucks Twitter low-key does pretty well breaking stories. I mean... <laughs> I remember a while ago, somebody <laughs> sent me a DM saying that they were on a flight and they were they had overheard Carey Price talking about retiring, that he was done playing. <laughs> and I mean, to me, I was like, since this is a retirement thing, yeah. I don't like yeah. I'm not gonna break that. That's sure. not my that's not my thing. Plus, that's not a reliable enough source. I would have had to start making calls. I'm just like, you know what, we'll we'll leave it. And sure enough, later that week, I, I think it came out that price was uh was done but the point being canucks twitter these airports anytime you're on yvr as a hockey player you gotta be careful maybe i don't know get a generic bag maybe not vegas golden knights <laughs> branded like honestly i i think kessel would have got spotted because you know He's clearly those people were canucks fans and if you're a hockey fan you see phil and i don't know if we have the photo i don't think i put it in the work tape my bag ready but the photo of phil if you've seen it folks he's looking pretty trim like I, that was my first reaction when I saw it was, wow, he's in, you know, he looks like he's in good shape. Like he looks better than Kuzmenko did coming into training camp. And yeah. so I'm not even making a joke. Like he literally looks thinner than Kuzmenko did. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm going to start comparing <laughs> Kessel physiques? and Kuzmenko's physiques, 
But I am curious to see the potential fit here. What is the fit, Harm? Like, let, let's start there. Let's start there because I tweeted this out yesterday. I've seen all these people say, where the hell is Kessel going to fit? And my general take is that, look, it doesn't really matter when you have Pia Suter, Niels Hoaglander, Ilya Mikheyev, Sam Lafferty, Phil Giuseppe, all getting stints in your top six. And look, Nils Hoglander looks like he's going to be a solid fit there and to stay. But the thing about it is going out and adding depth to it doesn't mean that. And when I sent that out, everybody's, oh, you, you're so mean to Suter and Hoglander. It's not it at all. Those are good players, but those are better players when they're down in your lineup. Like imagine Pia Suter being able to have him on a fourth line. Like that makes your fourth line that much better. Yes, but the... Uh... Kind of argument would be that Phil Phil Kessel also is extremely unlikely to be a full time top six player. Yeah, but it's such a low risk that if he is, then I think that's found money for you. It is, uh, although there is an opportunity cost in terms of the cap space, right? They don't have a lot to to work with, and well, if you're getting Kessel, is you're... that the best use of the cap space, though? I think. But that's what, that's a valid what, question to ask. So this is this is this is where I come to is okay if he signs, we're can we all assume it's going to be sub one million? Like I, I think there's a different conversation. We're talking two million, but if he can be, if you can send down Phil Giuseppe to create the the roster spot, mm-hmm. which you have to do, you have to send down someone. Uh, J Pad explored this at at Canucks Army today. You know, it'd probably be Mark Friedman, uh, probably Phil Giuseppe. If you can send one of those guys down and create the room for Kessel, the only cap implications that actually come of it are next season if Kessel hits his bonuses because he's going to sign a contract, you would assume, that has bonuses as a veteran player, according to the CBA. He's going to sign a contract that has bonuses. So if he hits those bonuses, which, by the way, he would do by playing games for the Canucks, which is a good thing, right? If he hits those bonuses, they go to next year's cap. And that's where the implications would come. But you got a lot of cap space for next year. I just I don't look at this and say, oh, well, I'm worried about the cap space because if it doesn't work out, like, first of all, this, this could all be a moot point because if the workouts don't go well, then he's not going to sign a contract and none of this matters. But if they do go well and he signs a contract, the only way it's having real implications on your cap, at least in my opinion, is if he hits those bonuses that go into effect for next year if he hits them. Think of Yaroslav Halak. That's the most recent example I can think I'm of. I'm not worried about the cap. I, I'm still unsure about the on-ice fit. Is, is the main point. Fair um, enough. And that's not to say it's a bad move. I think it's I think because, it's a fine bet to roll the dice. And sorry to yeah. keep interrupting you. My bad. Yeah. And I mean, that's why you bring him bring him in for a workout rather than signing him right away. Um, yeah, he's been off the he hasn't played a game in 10 months. You got to see where his his pace is at, right? That's first and foremost. You know, for a guy of his age, how effective is he gonna really be? It's gonna take some time for him to get up to game shape. You wanna hear something? I had this on Twitter yesterday. I, I don't even know if I tweeted it, but I, I had to look it up because people, and Frank brings it up. For, we pre-recorded with Frank, like I said. He'll bring it up that the Vegas Golden Knights chose to play 18 games in the playoffs without Phil Kessel. How many games did the Vegas Golden Knights choose to play without Teddy Bluger in their lineup? What? He didn't I'll tell you the answer. 16. Teddy Bluger played in six games for the Vegas Golden Knights in their playoff run last year. Kessel played in four. They have the exact same number of points in those games. And I know it's not all about points. What I'm trying to say is that he was a scratch on the Stanley Cup winning Vegas Golden Knights isn't as airtight of an argument as you think because another guy who was a scratch on that team, Teddy Bluger, is an integral part of the third line right now. The third line that we're going to talk about when we recap the Canucks versus Blackhawks game. I'm just saying don't write off Phil the thrill just yet. Like I think it's I think it's a low risk bet and also to some extent I know this sounds kind of shilly, but I'm kind of past the point of like dissecting or doubting what this management group is doing when it comes to player personnel decisions. Like, I think they've done enough now where it's like, okay, they're looking at a guy. It's a low risk guy. I'm looking at it and saying, Oh, okay. There might be something there. They clearly trust him. We know about the relationship. Pull those photos up, Grady. Uh, the relationship with Jim Rutherford. Um, and of course, Rick talking as well with Kessel. If those guys who are making this decision think that he's at least a wor- worth a look at. And then if those guys then think he's worth a contract, Who am I to come out here and say, oh, I don't know. I don't know about this. I don't know what this means for Phil DiGiuseppe or Mark Friedman. Come on. What are we talking about here? Look at these photos. Look how happy Jim Rutherford looks in that photo. (laughs) Look at Talkit. And for those on the podcast, 
uh, I'll, I'll do the described described video. Uh, Talking is grabbing Kessel's jersey, and guess what they're both wearing? Stanley Cup champion hats. Don't you want to see that in Vancouver? I sure do. I didn't know all the people that don't like Phil Kessel hate winning cups. What year were those cups, quads? And what year is it now? A couple years ago. Just a couple years ago. So, yes, they're very familiar Are you with trying to player. say Jim Rutherford and Rick Talkett are washed? No. I'm s- no. I'm saying, <laughs> the player, I'm saying the player that they acquired is different from the player that, that they had on those Stanley Cup winning teams. But that's why he's working out. That's why right. they haven't signed him to a contract. Right. They got to see it with their own so, eyes. Playoff time. Let me throw this at you. Yeah. What ramps up? The physicality. The speed. The ice shrinks. You need to be defensively responsible. How many of those things I just listed does Phil Kessel check? Maybe the speed. I know he was pretty quick last year, but again, hasn't played in 10 months, 36 years old. What's one of the first things that players lose when they get older? I'm going to raise you. I'm going to raise you something, Grady. Jack Eichel last year said that they would not have won the cup without Phil Kessel. Yes, he played in four games. We are totally, totally not taking into account how much of a good presence that guy is. Played a full 82. So. Played a full 82. He's still got the Iron Man streak. Like, if he comes back, he's still got the Iron Man streak. And, and he's made it clear that, you know, that's not a priority of his when he's signing. He's looking for the right opportunity. Maybe that opportunity comes to Vancouver. I don't want to I don't want to sit here and dissect about what this could mean for Mark Friedman. And this, I'm not trying to disrespect these players that I'm saying, who cares what happens? You're trying to ice the best team. That's what it comes down to. And I'd like to think that Mark Friedman would agree with me. That, yeah, okay, Phil Kessel is more deserving of a roster spot, which is what the Canucks are trying to figure out right now, is if he's going to be able to help them in the playoffs in any capacity, they're just adding to their depth for free. I think, here, here, I'll give you this. I think having Phil Kessel on your roster over Mark Freeman, over Phil DiGiuseppe, and those are the only two players I'll say, I think that is more beneficial for a playoff run than having those two guys on your roster. Either of them, give or take. Maybe, we'll see. I... I I can't agree Again, or disagree with yeah. any certainty right now. Um, we need to, we, bottom line, we need just to see yeah. where his game's at. Are right? we, are we also going to bring up the Phil Kessel is not a playoff performer argument? Who said that? No one said that. Yeah. Sound, she, sounded like we're heading that way. There was a case way. for no. him to win the cons mice. One of yeah. those Pittsburgh runs. Last year. <laughs> yeah. And his four games played in the first round. All right. And, and just back to Bluger, you got to remember too, like he was acquired at the deadline last year for depth. When they had Eichel, when they had Chandler Stevenson, William Carlson, Nicholas Waugh. So correct me if I'm wrong, I think he was playing even on the wing a bit too. So the lesson, in my opinion, is that depth matters. They right. gave up a third round pick for Teddy Bluger for him to play six games in the playoffs. Teddy Bluger still mattered to that team. I'm not trying to undermine Bluger's contributions to the Vegas Golden Knights in those six games he played. I'm just saying that if you're if we're bringing up that depth matters, right? You can have a free depth signing instead of going out and trading for a third round pick or trading a third round pick away to go get this depth. You can go get it potentially for free. Again, none of this matters until they actually sign Phil Kessel. Yeah. I'm just saying, you know, you don't have to sit but, here and contort yourself into a pretzel trying to figure out where he's going to fit in the lineup. It's about carving what type of role that he will have an impact in, right? He could come in and play PP2. PP1. Put him over Suter. Yeah. I, well, well, Suter's not on PP1 anymore. Oh, that's right. PP2. Sorry, I was quoting Nar. In there the is spots <laughs> in the lineup, but I just I just want to push comes to shove. Also, throw him a PP1. What's Lindholm doing for you lately? Uh, yeah. You see, I mean, he's good too in the he uh, did. in his first uh, game. Can tip pucks. Nice play by uh, Hoglander on the four check. Yeah, let, let, let's move on. Let's move on to this. I think I had a... Hang on. I got a... No, I don't. Okay. Let's get to our recap of anything on Kessel that you wanted to get in. Okay, uh, let's get to our recap of last night's game. The win over those Chicago Blackhawks, and it is brought to you by our friends over at Four Winds Brewing. Family-owned and operated in Delta, home to the Four Winds light, light Lager, a crisp, clean, and easy-drinking beer. A beer for everyone, a perfect beer for before, after, or during the game. Ask for Four Winds Light Lager at your local liquor store or have some delivered right to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. We got some right behind me there. That Four Winds Light. Beautiful. Beautiful. Just like last night's win over the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, where do you want to start? I think we got to get to Dakota Joshua, Nils Hoglander, and Connor Garland. Where would you like to start? Before that, I just want to say that I was happy with the Canucks performance. Really happy. The result, I mean, we expected it to be a win, but the way they executed it, they came out and just smothered the Blackhawks. Mm-hmm. The Blackhawks' lack of puck 
moving skill in the back end was completely exposed by how tenacious the Canucks were on the four check, which is what I wanted to see. I didn't want to see the Canucks sleepwalking through this game and and it be a sort of a, a sort of tight contest like the first time they played them. Yeah. Where it was the second leg of a back to back. And how long did it take for the Canucks to generate their first shot? Uh, whereas this time the 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 tables were turned. The Blackhawks didn't get their first shot until 30 seconds left in the first period. Um, it and was then they all got two off in that last 30 seconds. It was it was pretty remarkable to see how many plays the Canucks kept alive in the offensive zone, whether it be the defensemen or the wingers along the wall. They were just winning so many battles. Uh, of course, a massive part of that was uh, the third line. They just have such excellent passing chemistry. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's pretty crazy. I mean, you look at Garland's first first goal. First of all, credit to Philip Peronik for stepping up reading chicago's breakup and um stealing that uh, neutral zone pass and then garland and joshua garland has the puck going down the right wing head up the entire way so you can't read is this guy gonna shoot is this guy gonna pass slides it across to joshua same thing with joshua it's not as if he has his head turned looking back at garland where if you're peter Morazic, you're like oh it's going back yep. to garland he has his head up and you have to respect that and once you get the goalie moving side to side like that i mean what an unbelievable passing play for them to connect on. Um, and then the Joshua goal where Quinn Hughes makes the nifty play on the entry. And then this line just whenever they have the puck in the corner or they have it behind the net. And usually it's one of Garland or Bluger, usually Garland that has the puck in those situations. They just do such an unbelievable job of somehow getting the puck into the slot, which is tough to do because Every team in the NHL, the way they defend nowadays is they're fine to let you have the puck in those corners. They're yep. fine to, to let you have the puck behind the net so long as they're packing the slot and taking those passing lanes away. So for that third line to consistently find those seams to hit Joshua where he finishes with the be- with the beauty move across Morazic, it's... It's special the the passing chemistry they have, and then a fight too for Joshua Gordy Howe Hattrick with the all time leader in Gordy Howe Hattricks, Rick Tockett, standing on the bench. I loved I loved Joshua's game last night. Absolutely loved it. Also, we're gonna get to our bet wave of the day later, but I called Nils Hoglander to score a goal. Yeah, he did you just did. that, and I also sent it to Grady as well in my in my personal app. I had uh, Joshua as well as any time goal scorer. So what we should be doing is letting me do multiple betway bets of the day, but I got a heater for today but we'll get to it later um with that blackhawks game i also kind of think we have to talk about the play of the top six um obviously nils hugliner scores the goal that was great for him but didn't love what i saw from brock Besser, jt miller Elias Pettersson, and it feels like that's becoming a bit of a trend yeah i thought the Pedersen line was totally fine I-, I think he was generating chances I think that all Swedes line as a whole was buzzing. Hoagland, of course, had had the goal, but even throughout the game, I felt like they were they got a couple grade A chances off the rush. You've got to keep those guys together, though. Yeah, like there was one play in the third period, for example, where Lind Lindholm and Hoaglander connect on a pa- on a passing play on an entry. Um, one of them snaps it across. I think it was Lindholm across to Pedersen, who had a grade A rush chance in the slot, like. That's that's the type of look he um, he usually buries. And if he scores on that, we're not talking about uh, Pedersen in that way. I, I I don't have a, a problem with his performance, honestly. And um, even the Miller line, I don't think they were particularly great. But I also don't think they were that they played poorly. Any concern? <clears throat> excuse me. Any concern over the power play going over four? Because I think that's where my criticism is going to start. Yeah, the power play. Power play did not look sharp. Yeah. Okay. They, and I think that's become the trend. They, they've had issues on entries mm-hmm. more than usual, uh, and also situations where shots just aren't getting through uh, traffic. I'm looking back on my notes to see what I had on on the power play. Yeah, it's just like little things. Like I have here on the first power play, a Hughes to Besser pass on the you know, from the point to the flank that's off the mark and gets cleared. Like, that usually doesn't happen. Another trend that I noticed, Pedersen a couple times was faking the one-timer and then trying to step into the middle to set up for the wrist shot. And the Blackhawks just 
weren't biting on that and Pedersen had one or two turnovers, that's where Pedersen hasn't been sharp is he is you're right. Like his puck management hasn't been now that I even think back to five and five, there were one or two giveaways. His puck management hasn't been as sharp as usual. And we're especially feeling it on the power play, but I'm not, Put it this way, I'm not worried about those guys at even strength in terms of what we saw in the Chicago game, but I do agree that the power play needs to be a lot better. Like that that power play was not very good at all. One thing I will say, just looking at my game notes, um, they did start moving more. Like, did you notice that? It looked like a they were doing bit. some movement, and we were talking yeah. about in a recent show that one thing they've gotten away from was at the start of the year, we heard them talking so much about, yeah, we just, we're going to move more. There's going to be more movement, kind of like what we see from the Oilers power play, which is always super dangerous. Uh, I saw that last night, so I thought that was a positive, but there were just a few instances where I was like, oh, this is the Blackhawks you're up against. Like, yeah, it's Chicago. You should be able to score on four opportunities. Well, I think the bigger trend is just early in the season, the quickness with which they were snapping the puck around, how sharp their passing was, was unbelievable. And you expect that when you have four passers of those caliber. I won't include Lindholm since he's just joining. But when you have Hughes, Miller, uh, Besser, and Patterson, especially, uh, you know, the three of them, not especially the three of them, Besser maybe less so, but you expect them to go tape to tape every time. You don't expect them to have issues bobbling the puck or or crowling it or um, like some of the shorthanded goals where, you know, Miller's trying to go back to the point and, and there's a turnover there. That's that's been the you you don't have the same level of Christmas. I still believe in the talent. Like I think they should be able to figure it out heading into the playoffs. But I also come back to this. Like as a team, it's so rare to play perfect hockey. Like there's always going to be a part of their game that we can nitpick. Like oh, like now it's a power play, or two weeks from now it could be. Oh well, the fourth line is giving up a little bit more than that than we'd ideally like to see defensively or oh the third pair Juleson isn't quite where he hey, was right it. now watch it i'm not saying that's what, <laughs> what, what's happening i'm just Karan, throwing out hy- hypotheticals in that same vein Karan said are we getting a tune-up segment who does harm hate today <laughs> no um <laughs> we're getting one tomorrow and it's now called under the hood we said this these are rich people show. problems that's right yeah you're absolutely correct we're talking you're about rich correct. people problems and, and j-pat brought this up the connects are what 12 1 and 3 yeah and if and you know that, that's the best record in the nhl in that time he tweeted out yeah yet it still feels like they haven't been playing there's perfect a plus hockey yep which fair enough that's that's a hard bar to reach for that's a mark of a good team too that you're still getting yeah. victories when you're not playing at your best i Again, it's Chicago, so you knew they were going to get the winner. You, you hoped they would, but uh, four points clear of the Boston Bruins for first in the NHL standings. Yeah, overall, the LA Kings, fifteenth overall. I'll just say this: even though, yeah, the power play wasn't great, and and maybe you want to see a little bit more from Miller and Besser and potentially Pedersen overall. I have nothing to complain about with that Chicago performance, big picture, they, they came out and worked hard. Yep. Gave, they gave Chicago nothing. I mean, Luke, Luke Richardson, Chicago's coach uh, after the game was saying that there's nothing Chicago should be proud of after the game. Wow. Yeah. I thought Niels Huglander just looked really, really solid on that line. Oh you, yeah. Especially him. You have to keep him on that line. Get him on the power play. Like, it's so weird watching them come over the boards for power play. And Niels is nowhere to be seen. It's just weird at this point. Yeah, it's it's really strange. Doesn't make sense. I don't need to see Ilya Mikheyev on there anymore. Oh man. You guys see Wag's tweet last night? About, no, what did he tweet? About how Mikheyev's had just under an hour of power play time. Oh, this I did year. see that. Yes, yes, I did Zero see that. Points. Yes. Yeah, and Niels Hunglander, 17 goals, all at five on five. Yeah, and like just under six hundred minutes. I was looking at it today. Yeah. It's it's crazy. Energizer bunny, I love it. Jeff Patterson, our pal, tweeted this out. Uh, do you want to get? Do you have anything on the Chicago game before we move back to Kessel? Because that's what I want to talk about. To anyone else? Okay. Oh, you can... Noah Juleson. Forgot to say, I forgot to do a victory lap. Uh, Noah Juleson had another outstanding game last night. Uh, yeah, I, I don't even know what to say. I was right. I told everybody so. And <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make sure that got out there. Yeah, talk your stuff, man. Yeah, that's right. Also, Rich Jones. Uh, tweeted at me last night. Shout out to Rich Jones. Said, I ask once again, has Juleson entered the Norris conversation? Stay tuned for our interview 
with Frank Cervalli. I asked Frank how much national attention Noah Juleson's getting. How many GMs are talking about Noah Juleson right now? Hopefully it's a lot. Hopefully it's a lot. Won't spoil it. Yeah. Noah Juleson's been fantastic. Noah Juleson's been awesome. Uh, okay. Let's get to... What do we have? Oh, no. I got to tell you about a sponsor. And then you're going to do anyone else. Yeah. I got to tell you about a sponsor of ours. And that would be HSBC World Rugby Sevens. Western Canada's largest sporting event. This year is the ninth time the event has visited Vancouver as part of the World Rugby Sevens series. Tickets are on sale now at vansevens.com starting from just $40 per day. From February 23rd to 25th, BC Place is going to be the place to be. So grab your friends and your best costume and head on down. And if you want to go, we've got a four-pack of tickets for the entire weekend to give away. Text hashtag sevens. That's S-E-V-E-N-S to 778-402-9680 for your chance to win. We'll be giving away a four-pack each week until the event. Text hashtag sevens to 778-402-9680. It's time for anyone else presented by DoorDash. It's our listeners' chance to get involved. And hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listeners' chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. Offer valid in Canada. Subject to change. Terms apply. Double Dash, baby. Use that Double Dash. It's fantastic. One delivery fee. It's great. One delivery fee. You get what you want. You get whoever, whatever else or whoever else you're with. They get what they want. Everybody is very, very happy. All right. Um, someone in the chat asked. Yeah, KQ, do you guys like the Kessel ad? I absolutely love the Kessel ad. It hasn't happened yet, but I like it in theory. I really like the idea of them signing. This is the thought I had, Harmon. When you're watching games and we're talking about cup experience and whatnot, when you're watching games and the team's having a stinker, do you not just have like the thought of like, all right, what if Rick Tockett suited up and just jumped over the boards? Or like, what if Henrik and Daniel City and were on the power play? Just you suited them up, power play specialists, they hop over the boards. Do you not just no. wonder about that ever? No. When the team's dropping an absolute stinker on the ice, like full squat right in the center ice. <laughs> what if Sergei Gonchar was with Noah Juleson? There you go. Man, think of what Sergei Gonchar's career could have been if he had played with a guy like Noah Juleson. <laughs> okay, stop. All right. But I, I, in all seriousness, c- cup experience matters so much. And Ian Cole's like the only guy that has it. Teddy Bluger to some extent, sure. But man, I look at it and I just say, if, if Kessel is in shape and he's an upgrade on who you have. And I don't, I don't think that's a very, Corey Anderson said, not a high bar to clear for him to be better than like Phil DiGiuseppe, the way he's played lately, right? Or Sam Lafferty or whoever, right? Not a huge bar to clear. And if that guy can play on your power play and help out your power play, I just, it's such a low risk move that I like it. I want it to work. I want it to work. Phil Kessel's awesome. That would be a terrific story. Oh, it'd be so much fun. Plus he's a really likable guy in the locker room. Absolutely. And that's the thing. That matters a lot. So I, I hope it works out. I do. Okay, let's move on from Kessel. Uh, Corey Anderson. Uh, sorry, we'll get to Corey's in a sec. Uh, Karan asked, and I'll throw this to you because we were talking about it right before we went to air. How much do we think Joshua, Dakota Joshua, gets in free agency? Okay. That's a good question. I haven't had a chance to pull up comps, so that's... I'll answer a question while you do that. Okay. Well, I, I mean, that takes like at least 30 minutes to do. Oh, wow. um, I'm trying to think because Joshua is going to be an interest in an interesting spot because he is on pace for, let's pull it up here. He's got 20. a good shot at, re, at hitting 20 goals and 40 points, but he's never been that player before. Mm-hmm. Right. Last season was the first time he's even been an everyday NHL pe- player period. Uh, so it's a bit of a unique spot. I also wonder about this theory that I've thrown out there to you, Harmon, before. And Frank says I'm out to lunch for even thinking it. But there are a few positions that have been very hurt by the NHL's flat cap, which we know is going to end next year. But it's bottom six wingers that got hurt among the most in terms of position groups that got hurt the most. Like you think about the Tyler Mott situation where he doesn't resign in Vancouver because he didn't like what they were offering. They trade him at the deadline, goes into free agency. Can't really find a steady home. Just can't do it, even though he was so, so loved in Vancouver. 
Dakota Joshua is about to put up way better numbers than Tyler Mott. So he's, he's, he's in a different kind of conversation. He's got that size. He's got a lot of things that coaches, general managers will really, really like about a player. I look at him as somebody who's going to get up at least, I, I think to start, he's looking for like a two by two. And I think he gets that on the open market. Oh, easily. Okay. So I've got one comp here. Let's hear it. Uh, it's not perfect because they're different stylistically, but kind of similar enough is like third line players also provide PK value. Joshua's of course more physical. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jesper Faust in his final year in New York had 29 points in 69 games. So his production wasn't quite on par, uh, with, um, with Joshua, but he had a long, longer track record, track record of being a sort of consistent 30 plus point guy played in the league too, for longer played in the league for longer. And in free agency, he got 2.4. I'm trying to see how many years of term he got. Uh, one sec here. 2.4 million times. Actually, no. So originally he got two times three, but that was in uh, 2020 when everybody's market value was down. Like you remember Toffoli went for such a bargain. Um, he extended for 2.4 times two. So could Joshua push, given his unique physical profile, the two and a half million range? Potentially. Uh, but also, full disclosure, this is like literally two minutes of research. I love that. I think he's getting three million. I think Man. he's getting a three by three. Yeah. Think AFP so? Analytics has a projection service they do. They got him at three years, just a hair over three million. I like this. Uh, Karan said this. We all know GMC, see a big boy who scores goals and gives him five mil. Sorry, what was that? I missed it. About Joshua. Yeah. We all, GMs are going to see a big boy who scores goals and give him five million. <laughs> that's high. That's very high. And I mean, Greenway got three million. Yeah, and that's the name I brought up to you earlier too. It is, I don't know. Set a career high in points last night. So, And he's only 27, right? So you could, maybe there's a team out there that wants to give him four or five years. I don't know. I mean, four or five years would be that's hefty a for lot. what he is, but you also have to consider the cap is going up. And in today's day and age, like he's a unicorn player. When you got a guy that can score, you know, lead the league forwards and hits for the most part, uh, fight, those aren't easy always to come by. One thing I will also mention in relation to keeping Joshua is. If you're re-signing Joshua, you also have to keep Garland. Yes. Yeah. I think Garland is the key to unlocking Joshua because Joshua has a skill set to... He has a soft hands around the net. He can finish. He mm -hmm. can get open. But he needs a guy to feed him the puck there, which Garland has done unbelievably well. Anytime he has the puck below the, below the offensive dots, the way Garland can spin and turn off checks, make those little slip passes, you need... Joshua and Garland together for for that to work, and I hope that Canucks management has been convinced that Garland is an important five and five driver to keep beyond this season. Because look at earlier points um, when, especially when management first took over, Garland is a name they were shopping. Hashiroku here, just sign him until the gone Garland contract is up. The old Ian Clark and Thatcher Demko. That's what the Canucks did. Is Ian Clark's contract was up. So they just matched it with Demko's term. Thatcher yeah. Demko got his contract extension for five years. And Ian Clark, not in terms of dollar figure, I don't know the dollar figure, but in terms of term, got the exact same term. They're like, well, Thatcher Demko works when he's working with Ian Clark, so we'll just leave you two together. And they have to do the same thing with Garland and Joshua. I love it. I love it. All but, right. Um, I want to say this about the Joshua. Did you have something? Sorry. Yeah, I, I also just wanted to quickly say, like, if you asked me 20 games ago mm -hmm. about keeping Joshua... I would have said, I love him as a player, but seems like a luxury to be re-signing a bottom six player at um, at a hefty price. But I'm being convinced that you got to keep this guy, even I though it. I don't yeah. like paying bottom six yeah. guys uh, a premium. Like, he's just too unique of a profile because of his physicality. Yeah. I mean, especially the PK. Like, that's huge now in terms of him being one of the top go-to shorthanded options a first over the boards type of um killer and you're seeing the impact for the canucks defensively there uh yeah i'm i'm being convinced you're getting joshua pilled baby you're getting joshua pilled. now he's getting pp2 time yeah. so oh, Nils really i should think, be getting some but yeah back to your point though you know before kind of 
we've seen him really rise his game here of late. I think the key was to find that next Dakota Joshua in free agency. That's not going to cost, you know, three by three, let's say, right? I think the easier option here is to let Teddy Bluger walk. And hey, if there's an option to maybe get out from Ilya Mikheyev's contract in the offseason, maybe free up a little money that way. Sorry, we have someone in the chat that... Uh... Ah, ignore him. No, I'm not ignoring it. Because he's a regular listener of the show, so I appreciate him listening. He's but... listening to the wrong pod. I just went and looked back. Like, we were talking. That's what I'm trying to figure away. out. He said we were BSing for 16 oh, minutes. We Guys. talked about fencing and curling for like five. And was no, were, were people not riveted by my fencing conversation? <laughs> Man, there goes my next podcast idea. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, I don't think we were BSing for 16 minutes. Also, listen to the podcast. Just skip. People, I only did this because people were asking. They're like, I miss you and Faber and you and Harm BSing. You guys never do that anymore. And it's because obviously we got a tighter show. We got to fit things in. But man, we do it once. And he did the thing. He's like mocking listeners. Yeah, I'm mocking you. Yeah. Where's my puck talk? There it is. Right there. We gave it to you for the past 40 minutes. Maybe not 40 minutes, but 60. We didn't call it anyways. Thanks for listening. It's a lifestyle. Karan, there we go. I could listen to quads talk about fencing all day. The people yearn for the fencing. I don't. I'll Whatever. be honest. I, I, I don't mind BSing back and forth once in a while, but fencing wasn't that interesting. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. If the Canucks win the cup, Harmon and I will fence. Sure. Agree? All right, let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Can I be special guest referee? You can, you can officiate the... Hey! <laughs> I used to be an umpire back in the day. Oh. That, that was an umpire's call that I did. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I need I need your ring them up quads. Uh, a little ring up motion. I I used to umpire. We should do like a one v one sports showdown in in the summer. Like that'd be so yes. fun. Have you seen? And we're going off hockey. Sorry guys. Have you seen? Uh, Dude Perfect does this thing called all sports golf. So you get a bag and you've mm. got a football. You've got a golf club like a driver. Uh, and you've got like a hockey stick and a baseball bat and a ball. And you can you you choose once you choose a sport item to use to move your ball forward, you lose that one. And then you get like a frisbee too. Okay. Uh a soccer ball. You kick the soccer ball as far as you can. And you go to that place and then you have to use your next item. And you can choose which items to use, uh. but you want to save the I think you get like a putter or something. You want to save whatever you can for the end when you need to get it in the cup, right? I think you get a putter once you get to the green. But it's such a cool concept. Yeah. We just got to find a golf course that'll let us do that at their uh, golf course. Might be a little pricey. But anyways, I love that. Yeah. Battle mode Bainbridge. I want to hear about actual fences. Like a strong white picket. I painted fences for a summer. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. I learned so much about painting. Like, you know, you got you to gotta do so many coats to get a, a good wood fence painted properly. Man, it's hard. Are you like, one of those college pro painter guys? No, I wasn't. I dude, Quadrelli painting. Not even joking. I did it by myself. I was I just bought myself paint. I was like, I'm not working for anybody. I'm keeping a profit. Door to door. Yeah. I had like handed out cool. flyers. Yeah. yeah. Good life experience. I was hustling when I was like how probably like 15 at the time. Wow. I just got a job at um the trampoline park in Richmond that's now shut down Apex. Oh, there's a nice job. Yeah, yeah. I did umpiring. I was hustling back in the day. Three customers, none of them satisfied. All really? your family. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was good. It went well. It went well. All family members. But I did have to learn because I would come. I would come back the next day and be like, "This doesn't even look like I did anything." <laughs> and you have to do it again, anyways. I'm not going to get into. Actual. We need the chat to tell us what their weirdest first or early job was. Mine was erasing markings out of school textbooks and folding the pages over and cleaning up the book so they could then be resold back into the education system what was the worst thing you saw uh that's podcast i don't friendly. know if that's friendly for the show yeah. so we'll leave it at that you can uh you can use your imagination for that one quran quads was actually the karate kid for a summer <laughs> i did a lot when i was uh in the summer oh people are mad people are mad where's the parkour talk is what alec taylor said oh alec taylor i'm supposed to play him in rocket league and i, I forgot about it and alec i'll be honest i don't even play rocket league anymore so we'll have to do it you might beat me though so we'll have to do it message me again on instagram uh cory anderson first job was a stock boy in an auto parts warehouse my first job was umpiring my first real job that was like five days a week was summer of grade 11 so like a couple years ago um <laughs> second time i've used that joke uh was a laborer 
on a construction site wow. for my high school. My high school was getting rebuilt, so I was a laborer. That job sucked, but it paid a lot, and it was great. So anyways, it was fun. A lot of fun. All right. Logan Van Dyke, a mascot at Chuck E. Cheese. So you were Chuck. Like, Chuck E. Cheese. There's one mascot there, right? I've never been to Chuck E. Cheese. I've never either. Are they still around? I didn't even know they had oh, them. Oh, they were Yeah, great. yeah. We had, there was one in Langley. I remember driving by it and being like, why have I never gone to Chuck E. Cheese? Pretty sure I still have the tokens. Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, Langley. It's still there. It's still there. I know our watch parties at Greta. Langley's far, though, man. What? It's not that far. Dude, I had to do that commute five days a week for my one year of... Uh, okay, well, you don't have to go to Chuck E. Cheese five days a week. <laughs> but still... It's not that far. Once you do that commute five days a week... I guess you're in Vancouver. Especially in traffic from yeah. South End, you don't want to do it again. Yeah. Although, to, now that I think about it, I would just fire up pod, like Canucks podcast, and it'd be pretty fun. Jesse Bremner... Oh, I missed his comment. He said he said he worked somewhere. Can you pull it back up? Crady, it was a good comment. I wanted to read it. There it is. Reft hockey. McDonald's was my first real job. Yeah, reft hockey. Never reft hockey. Just baseball. All right. Well, we went a lot over time. And it was kind of... Uh, yeah. yeah. It's good once in a yeah, while. People like it once in a while. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything else to close out anyone else? Does anybody have any hockey th- stuff? I guess we should just close it out. We have an actual all hockey conversation with Frank Cervalli, and it was a good one. I know his answer when I asked him how much national media attention Noah Juleson is getting. But before we do that, got to deliver you our Betway bet of the day. Now, the reason this one is here is because I looked up the Norris Trophy odds on Betway. Whoa! And I tried to do Noah Juleson, <laughs> but you have to make requests. Like, you have to put in a request to Betway to include a player. I tried to pick Noah Juleson, couldn't pick him, so I went with Philip Aronik, who is listed on the odds at plus 10,000 odds. A $10 bet will return you $1,010. So is Quinn Hughes supposed to just, what, die or get injured here? Oh, knock on wood right now, Grady. No, Philip and then Philip Aronik's just going to lead the way. Philip Aronik, you know, if he... Uh... He's going to surpass Kale McCarr. You heard it here first. Yeah, if he starts playing with Noah Juleson, never know what could happen. Two, 41 points. Two right shots. 41 points for Philip Ronick. Uh, 37 assists on the season through 54 games. Yeah, I mean, if the Norris was a pure offense. <laughs> throw, throw, throw a dollar on it. <laughs> throw a dollar on it. All right. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy P. Flushing 10 bucks. <laughs> Literally, man. Pretty much. I didn't want to say anything, but. Oh, well, I tried to do no Juleson. Wasn't available. So Philip Ronick is good. He's on the board. He's on the board, folks. Well, what would no Juleson have returned? 50 cents gets you gets you 100 grand. Yeah. yeah that's, that's such a great amount of money. Oh, that's donation to Betway. <laughs> Plus 200,000 odds. Cody Sievertson, I just put a hundred on this bet. It just makes way too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, and we got people in chat. Uh, this is also a regular listener, Sun Lover sixty two. He said, "I gotta say, came here to hear about hockey. I'm not a big fan of the unrelated chatter, but that's just me. And hey, that's totally fair. Sometimes I don't like hearing myself talk about unrelated matters uh, on this show, and that's totally fair. And we'll we'll get right back to it tomorrow. It'll be an all hockey show tomorrow. But I had to get the fencing stuff off my chest." And uh, so did you one, though? I, uh, absolutely. That was a great, great talk. Great chick conversation. I'm going to add fencing to baseball, BCHL, <laughs> Clay Stevenson, <laughs> Shohei Otani as topics you're not allowed to talk about anymore. Yeah, I might have to make a graphic here. <laughs> Just cross them off. Worst topics to talk about? All right. We'll close it out there. Uh, for my co-host, Harmon Dial, our technical producer, Grady Sass, here is our conversation, pre-recorded conversation, with Frank Saravalli. All right, very pleased to be joined now by Frank Saravalli, who is brought to you fittingly by the Wendy's Daily Face-Off Survivor Pool game. Fitting Shit, up. we have a new read for this. My bad. Fuck. Sorry. That guy brought to you fittingly by a fast yeah. food restaurant. No, it's That's... Daily Face-Off. Oh. <laughs> that guy not fittingly fitting into his clothes. <laughs> Because of Wendy's and the Daily Face-Off Survivor. Pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still rolling. We're yeah, gonna... my apologies. Okay, they got me a new ad read. All right, here we go. <clears throat> All right, very pleased to be joined now 
by Frank Cervelli, who is brought to you by Wendy's Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool game. Wendy's is letting you win real food with your fantasy teams this year and Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool. For those of you who smoke the competition, Wendy's is rewarding you with weekly prizes that will have you winning. Download the Wendy's app and score yourself 150 bonus reward points on your first order and grab a sweet victory from the mouth-watering jaws of defeat, along with some fresh, never-frozen beef. Sign up to play Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool Fantasy to win weekly prizes like the spicy chicken sandwich from Wendy's and the Wendy's app. And the man himself from Daily Faceoff joins us now, Frank Cervelli. Thanks for doing this. How are you doing today? I'm good, but I, I've gotten smoked in the Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool again. I, I made it to day two, and I was just trying to make it to, to Wednesday, and the Boston Bruins failed me last night against the Bolts. I won one week, as I've said many times on this show, and I've, I got my points and I went to, it's a good amount of points. Like if you win, they really do reward you. Like I got enough for two bacon eaters on there. Oh, it's uh, yeah. Like, that's like that. You can already hear my arteries clogging. <laughs> <when I'm laughs> so. Yeah, it's a tough game. It's a tough I wouldn't game. know anything about this because I never win. Like it is legitimately hard. Every night there's 10 options and mostly two or three at win at the most. Yeah, fair enough. Cox are going to be looking for some more wins. And I think they're going to do that by signing Phil Kessel. Phil Kessel is working out in Abbotsford. Obviously, we saw the photos from YVR last night. Frank, uh, what can you tell us about this situation and what do you think the Canucks are looking for uh, with this workout with Phil Kessel? Well, what they're looking for is to see what kind of shape he's in. You know, it's great to tell everyone through your agent, oh, this guy's been training so hard working out. It's You got to actually see it with your own eyes. See where his game is. It's been a long time since he played any form of competitive hockey. And so that's one part of it. And see where is, see how sharp his skills are. What does his shot look like? With skating's one thing. Is his passing on time? Is it on the tape? Little things like that that I think they're just looking to see how close of a facsimile is the current Phil Kessel to someone who's typically you know in full game shape and how far away would he be from getting there? Frank, what do you think the appeal is from the Canucks perspective in adding Phil Kessel? Obviously, they just went out and acquired Elias Lindholm. Uh, and you wonder at this point if Phil Kessel really has enough to be a full-time top six. And you also have the bottom six, which may not necessarily be the best fit for Kessel. Uh, what's the appeal from the Canucks perspective here? Well, Harm, the appeal is easy. It's we have a team that we are, you know, we believe we're in contender mode. We've just added a huge piece. Assets are limited. Cap space is limited. And we could potentially basically fill a void on our roster using a free space on the bingo card. I mean, that's about as attractive as it gets. And then you consider the relationships that are in play. Rick Tockett, the Phil Kessel whisperer from Pittsburgh, his same GM. Um, and you know, now the same relationship with Patrick Alvin. Like, I think that all matters. Um, do I have authentic doubts about his ability to contribute to this team? I do. Um, I think the fact that the Vegas Golden Knights went 18 games in the postseason last year where they said our lineup is better without Phil Kessel in it, that to me would tell me a lot. And I think it probably did tell teams a lot around the league this year and why he remained unsigned or remains unsigned through Valentine's Day. Um, but I also see from the Canucks perspective that when you look at your lineup card, if you're Rick Tockett and you see Nils Hoaglander on your top line and Pew Suter playing wing on your second line, to think that this team can't actually get better, um, I think that's a fallacy. And I think one of the true hallmarks of this team and where they've been is they're not leaving any stone unturned unturned. Yes. They're not leaving any stone unturned. And if that means giving Phil Kessel a shot or not, at least they're trying to do something to continue to improve this team on the margins. The trade deadline is a few weeks away. If this works out, Frank, if it works out and they sign Phil Kessel, do you think that changes the trade deadline strategy at all? Were the Canucks even going to be big fish hunting for another winger um, coming up with this trade deadline? Like, what does this all mean for the Canucks trade deadline plans? No, I think they were mildly intrigued about the possibility without having to spend. And that's part of it. And I think from a pure deadline perspective, would this mean that they're done? Probably at the forward position, I would think that's the case. Um especially with the versatility that we know that Lindholm has to, to play on the wing, 
that he's you've made your big ad, but I still think that this team could use uh, a, at least one more defenseman to help prop up this blue line and to put them in a spot where when you have a deep playoff run, the bullets start flying, that you are really in a great spot to contribute if someone goes down. Frank, this seems like a complex deadline when you factor in the lack of sellers, considering how many teams are close to the playoff bar, uh, even just the lack of impact players, uh, it, you know, cap logistics and, and a lot of teams being um, in trouble there. What Western Conference contenders, with all those factors in mind, do you expect to be most aggressive at the deadline? So I want to quibble with one notion of what you're saying. I agree. I think the market is thin, but I don't think we're short on sellers. I mm -hmm. think we know enough now to know that Seattle, with their recent slide, um, we know the Flames are selling. That's not changing even with the games that they want on their East Coast swing. The Blues, the Preds, the Yotes. The Yotes have been bad the last few weeks. Uh, there's enough teams that are in that pool and then go out east and include the Flyers. You know, teams that are even, you know, right at, not, if not in the playoffs, knocking on the door of them, that they've sort of made this determination that this isn't their year end or that they're taking the long view. So I think we have enough sellers. I just think there's so much baggage on some of those teams, players with term, guys that aren't impact pieces, heavy prices when it comes to the trade deadline in general, that that's sort of what helps grind the market to a halt. But to answer your overall question, I would say, um, which Western Conference teams are we waiting to make a move? Colorado, um, I think on a lower scale, Dallas, who kind of quietly is, is leading the division. Winnipeg's made their strike. And then I think you've got Edmonton and Vegas. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Kings do something, but uh, we had a fun little segment today on Daily Face Off Live where it was like you could hand out a, a card to a Valentine and you had to break up with one. And for me, the team that I broke up with was the Kings. Like, I'm sorry, like getting shellacked. It's one game by the, by the Sabres. Like, come on. You've changed coaches, panic move. You've got a talented roster. Something's clearly off. Your goaltending is no good. I'm out on the Kings. Fair enough. We've been out on the Kings for a while, especially me. I don't like Pierre-Luc Dubois. I'm not sure if you've heard, but we won't start on that. We won't start on that. Um, I know who your real crush is on Valentine's Day. Noah Juleson? Noah Juleson. <laughs> yeah, how much national attention is he getting? Like, Are GMs just talking about this guy lots right now? Yeah, um, zero. <laughs> <laughs> zero <laughs> national attention how long until he enters the norris conversation the answer is never do you pick which phwa members get a vote because i've had a vote for the past two years oh okay. i have i have a I, I have a say yes so i better be careful before throwing out noah Juleson for norris yes okay. i think that would make you a an inauthentic unauthentic <laughs> voter ineligible to vote fair enough uh frank on your trade targets board we see noah hanovan we see chris tanev two defensemen obviously i watched your matchmaker segment today you've got hanovan going to the toronto maple leafs do you still think the canucks might be in on anyone on your trade targets board right now i could see them being in on tanev um i don't know this for certain but it wouldn't shock me if the canucks are one of the teams that would be willing to pay a second round pick for tanev and I think that would be a real nice price. Like, I think it's not going to be that far off than that. I don't think the Canucks are one of those teams that could stretch and say, hey, if we go on a deep run, the second could turn into a first because of the capital that they've already given up for Lindholm. And I think if you're the Flames, that's probably what you're really looking for. But I do think that there's a probably a pretty fair amount of interest in Tanev. I don't, I don't just, they'd have to get to a spot where they're, you would make the money work. Frank, what do you expect from the Tampa Bay Lightning? Because they're in an interesting spot. Um, Steven Samkos is a pending UFA at, at, at the end of the season. Their core is getting a little bit older. Mikhail Sergachev is, is out with an injury now, yet they're still a good team this year. Do you expect them to be in the market for some of these higher-profile rental defensemen like a Tanav or, or like a Sean Walker? Or um, do you expect them to perhaps address the need in a different way? I don't expect them to address it from a rental perspective because that's just, it hasn't been in their nature. Like go back and look at Julian Brisebois playoff or deadline playbook. And it would tell you whether it's 
Tanner Janot or Brandon Hagel, or he ended up signing Nick Paul long-term. Um, the players that he's brought in for the most part have been part of their long-term view. And that's been their way to justify really spending significant future assets. I mean, look at the Janot deal. It's, it, history hasn't been very kind to it over the last year, but a first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. I mean, that's like the majority of your draft board for an entire year. And yeah, they have him for a couple years, but he doesn't seem to be worth anything like the price that they paid. And I think they've just, I think they've reached an inflection point of we've had a lot of success. We've won two Stanley cups here. We've got a core that when they get into the postseason, can make noise. This East is as wide open as it gets. And some people might hear me saying this and say, well, why wouldn't they load up? But they don't have any more assets to deal to do it. They don't have a deep prospect pool. At some point, you're going to have to just go into the playoffs with exactly what you've got. And I think if you listen closely to what John Cooper is saying the last few weeks, it almost feels like he's telling or broadcasting to everyone that they're not a team that really deserves to, to go out and spend in a big way to add. What were your thoughts on the Morgan Riley incident and subsequent suspension? I love the slap shot into the empty net. Likewise. I love the response. I thought a cross check to the face was over the top and deserved to be suspended. I thought five games fit. And there's been this idea floating around on social media the last 48 hours of make hockey violent again. But my thing is that's probably a bridge too far, but why can't we make hockey spicy again? Like it's before your time quads, but Growing up as a hockey fan in the 90s, like you couldn't blink without Matthew Barnaby being on Sports Center one night for some ridiculous thing that he did to an opponent. It happened all the time. Hockey needs villains, they need heels, they need people who do dumb stuff. And we've been talking about it, and people have gotten nauseous talking about it because it's been such a big topic of conversation with the team from the self proclaimed center of the hockey universe. But I am here for any chaos that could ensue. There's a lot of chaos. There's going to be a lot of chaos in the playoffs, and we'll keep talking to you in the lead-up to that and the trade deadline. Frank, thanks so much for doing this. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you guys. Hey, where are you and uh, Juleson going to dinner tonight? <laughs> I haven't decided yet. Right. Maybe Italian Kitchen. I walk by that place all the time. You've been to Vancouver before. You've ever been to Italian Kitchen? I have not. I haven't either. Have you? No. All right, we got some research to do. Seems like a nice place. You and Noah do, apparently. Yeah, yeah exactly. I've got a, I, I went to a good sushi place in Toronto, though, and they said that their flagship location is in Vancouver. So I'm, I'm, I'm itching to get out there because I'm still thinking about that sushi. Yeah, there's good sushi out here. I'm not a big sushi Piku? guy. But, yeah. M-I-K-U? Yes. Oh, you've heard of it? Good. Yeah, popular among uh, Canucks players. Oh, well, there yeah, you go. Yeah, in Yaletown. Yep. Sweet. I'm not a big sushi guy, but yeah. They got it at Safeway. All right. Yeah, that doesn't count. That's doesn't. <laughs> this guy eats gas station sushi, okay? Oh, Nothing wrong with what? a good gas station California roll. What are we going to do with you, quads? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. All right, Frank. Thanks for doing this. See you guys. Canucks conversation with Harmon and quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is fresh look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric. The best part, by choosing electric, you can get up to $11,000 in rebates and incentives The BZ4X are in stock and selling quickly, so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local Pacific Toyota dealer to get your hands on one. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.